No hair transplant surgeon ever wants to face complications, but the reality is they do happen. Together, we are going to explore how to manage these challenges effectively and provide the best care for patients after a hair transplant. I am excited to be chatting with Dr. Robin Unger, a well-known expert in hair restoration, who will share her valuable insights and strategies for handling hair transplants, complications, and ensuring optimal outcomes. Dr. Unger, welcome. It's so great to have you here today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate being on your podcast. So let's just start out with like a basic question. What are the most common complications that you have encountered after hair transplant surgery? So I usually explain to patients, there's three that, you know, are, I I wouldn't say always, but they're par for the course. You can have swelling or bruising in the forehead or temple area. That's really quite common. Um, You can have change in sensitivity in your scalp, just small nerve endings that have been injured in the process. So parts might feel a little numb, parts might feel a little tender. um, And that comes back to normal over time. Um, And the third thing is the worst thing, which is you could have some telogen effluvium, some temporary shedding after surgery. It can occur either in the donor area, the recipient area, anywhere where you've injured the blood supply to the existing hair. If it happens and it's really a telogen effluvium, it always comes back. There are some scenarios, and I'm just mentioning it, it doesn't happen in my practice, but in some scenarios, if there's been mechanical injury to the hair follicles that were pre-existing in that a doctor made the angle for the site the wrong way and mechanically injured existing hair, there could be shedding that doesn't come back. That is not par for the course. Mm -hmm. That's actually a complication that shouldn't happen. And what do you do in that situation? Can you do like a revision? So, I mean, it doesn't, if you're careful, you follow the angle and direction of the existing hair, it doesn't happen. If I've seen patients where that's happened uh, with other surgeons, really, you just have to add more hair in. Um, There's not, you, you can't, once you've mechanically injured a hair there's very little yeah right so what are your thoughts on getting the least observable post-op scar which is something a lot of people are concerned about particularly when they're doing fut which is also known as strip um, and it often leaves this linear scar Um, do you recommend doing a trichophytic closure Um, how do we get the best results for our patients Okay. So I would say in my practice right now, I probably have about 40% of patients are um, strip or FUT. 30% are a combination of FUT and FUE and the other 30% about just uh, pure FUE. So with a strip harvest, um, the main issue is really to make sure that you close without undue tension on the wound. Um, If you take a really wide strip and you're closing with tension, you have a much higher chance of ending up with a widened scar. Um, The other things that may play a part is, you know, have you been careful in the approximation of the wound edges? Do you do deep sutures or just a single layer? And that varies in my practice, but I would say Um, lately I've leaned towards doing the double layer closure because it takes all the pressure off of the superficial layer, which I think generally does help get a better scar. The trichophytic closure, um, can be helpful in patients, um, who wear their hair really short, um, because it does help kind of fade or, or blur the line, even if it's only a one or two millimeter line, if it's 
you know, totally got no hair in it, you do notice something. So the trichophytic closure can be helpful for that. I usually only will use that if I'm doing a last surgery though, um, because it takes up ex excess laxity every time you do it. It's taking an extra millimeter of, of laxity. So I won't do it in a first surgery. Um, I do use intra intraoperative catalog um, on the day of surgery. Um, that helps calm any inflammation during the healing phase. Um, and so I do that on the day of surgery when patients come back for their post-operative checks. If I do see any inflammation, erythema beyond the normal, I'll add even more. Um, other things that give you a beautiful scar are good post-operative care. Keep it clean, keep it moist. Um, make sure that the doctor sees you during the post-operative period. And, you know, we keep an eye on things so that if we need to intervene, we intervene. Right. So I know some doctors use sutures for their closures. Others use staples. Do you see a difference in the cosmetic outcome between these two options? So that's really actually an interesting question because long ago, my dad and I tried a half head study uh, doing sutures on one side and staples on the other to see if we could see there was a difference. And we had to abort the study, but after about 12 patients, because the side with the staples was so much more painful, we couldn't actually justify pursuing it. Um, I've seen great scars from people who use staples um but i use sutures because they're much more comfortable in this post-operative period um and generally my scars are one to two millimeters i mean they're really a non-issue for most patients you have about three to five percent of patients who heal with slightly wider scars mm -hmm. and those can be patients that have hyperlaxity those can be patients who are really, really active in the post-operative period and they, you know, they're weightlifters or crossfitters or, um, and in those cases, uh, actually one of the newer things we're doing is actually injecting a little bit of Botox, both above and below the donor area to help prevent any pulling on the wound edges. Um, and not only does that seem to be helping with the scars, but it helps a lot with the comfort within two days. They say like that, that tightness they were feeling is almost um, gone. Yeah. So you read my mind because my next question was about Botox and about relieving the tension on the wound. Are you doing the Botox injections for every patient or just those who have like less laxity on their scalp? Well, up till now, I've been doing it for patients who have less laxity. I may start doing it for everyone. Yeah, if it doesn't it sound like there's any down. Oh. Yeah. Do you typically to mess the outlined incision before or after you are scoring the incision? Before. Before. Okay. Yeah, before, because we want everything to be kind of taut. Um, so that the, there's also a greater separation between the follicles. Um, it also gives us better uh, hemostasis. So that makes sense to me, but are you ever concerned that, you know, you're plumping up the skin and you may be making like a wider incision than you actually need to because it's, it's more taut and plumped up no. or there's no concern? No, because as soon as the tumescent comes out, it, it goes back to its original size. You know, I choose my size before I tumes, then I tumes, and then once the tumescent, you know, is is resolved, we're back to the normal size. Yeah. So say you have a patient who, you know, previously had a hair transplant somewhere else, which was a strip procedure, and they come to you and you see the scar and they want a second procedure. Do you typically 
I've heard actually a doctor I, I spent a little time with, he said, you know, I like to remove other, the other doctor's work. So I, I take that other scar out. Is that your same thought process? 100% unless there's a reason not to um so I think with a with a strip harvest you really should just leave one scar ideally um and it's one of the benefits of it you go back for a second surgery or a third surgery you take out the first scar or the second scar as part of your harvest so you're still leaving only one linear scar and I, I do get uh, patients that have been elsewhere and they have two or three rows of scar. Sometimes I can even get two of those scars out with my harvest and, and, and reduce it further. But I think it should be just one scar unless there's some outstanding circumstance. Right. Have you found any benefits to using 5FU? I know you mentioned using Penalog. Yeah, no, I I haven't used 5FU. I've heard of some people that thought maybe it could be helpful. Um, the Kenalog has worked really well for me. And sometimes we'll give also a topical that has a combination of clobetazole and um, garamycin. So they'll apply that if we see just some superficial erythema beginning at, you know, suture removal date, then I'll say, you know what, until the third week checkup, why don't you apply this topically and then we'll see how you do. And yeah. there are three weeks in, after surgery is typically where you're removing your uh, sutures. No, uh, we typically remove sutures about 10 days after. Okay. And because they, I, I think I've heard that, a thought process of like keeping them longer because it helps healing. So I always like to hear everyone's well, opinion. Yeah. I mean, I've heard everything from yeah. one week to six weeks. Right. So I find is once you get much beyond two weeks, the sutures start becoming embedded. They become really irritated. Patients find it very uncomfortable. I also, you know, as I said, very often I'm doing a deep layer. So once you have that deep layer in, it's going to help hold it. Um, I think most patients, you know, the 10 day mark is a good, a good point. Yeah, because after a while, they can start being itchy and, like you said, uncomfortable, and patients just want to get them out of their scalp already. Dr. Unger? Oh, no. Oh, oh. you're back. Okay, okay. perfect. We, you froze for a second. So, you know, as we age, many men um, and some women – but mostly men can get retrograde hair loss. Um, and of course, as we age, that retrograde hair loss can get worse. Is there any concern that, you know, they're going to have this linear scar um, and it's going to become more visible with age? So do you recommend doing scalp micropigmentation? You froze. Okay, you're back. Uh, okay. Um, so I'll repeat, I'll repeat my question. So as we age, mostly men get retrograde hair loss and which means that the hair in the back is starting to climb up, um, the scalp. And as we age, obviously this micro, this retrograde hair loss can get more significant and progress. And if they've had a prior, um, strip procedure, the concern is that this scar will become more visible with time. Do you ever consider um, doing scalp micropigmentation for this um, donor site scar? So if a strip has been taken from the right location, it will not show with retrograde nor further lowering from above. It really will not. Um, if the scar shows uh, because it was taken in the wrong location, I would say yes. Scalp micropigmentation is a great option. We do offer that. We can also put um, grafts in it with FUE grafts can be placed in it. Um, and usually it's pretty easy to hide. I do have some patients who had, you know, their strips were taken quite high and they've, they've, their crown hair loss has actually revealed it. 
that's a much more difficult one to correct because it's now an alopecic area with a scar showing. Um, and in that case, then I say, we'll try using actually permanent makeup that mm -hmm. is used just to match the skin color. So it doesn't look like a, you know, hypopigmented scar sitting there. Right. But the strip taken from the right location will not show even long term. Yeah. So as hair transplant surgeons, the focus is to always try to take it from the safe zone. And if you go outside that safe zone, then you can have problems like a, a revealed scar that it's just either too low or sometimes even too high, like Dr. Unger just shared with us. So are there any specific types of patients, perhaps racial um, predilections, like who are more prone to say, Getting keloids, obviously we know that darker skin tone um, individuals, African Americans are more prone to keloiding. Um, so in that situation, if if you have an African American patient who comes in or a darker skin individual and they want a hair transplant, do you determine like, you know, there would be a better candidate for FUE versus strip because the likelihood of keloiding is less? So, um, yes, there are individuals who have either hypertrophic healing history or keloid history. Um, in those patients, uh, it can happen actually with either harvest method. And I've had the unfortunate experience of having to help manage another surgeon's FUE patient who had hypertrophic healing of FUE sites. Um, so it was an African-American individual and it was diffuse and I had to inject ILK diffusely and it calmed it right down, two sets of injections. So mm -hmm. it can happen with FUE, it can happen with the FUT. Um, I will say the easier part is if we have just a line, I have to inject rather than a whole, a whole scalp. scalp, but we've done it for both. Um, and it works quite quickly, as long as you get on top of it quickly. So I will say in the individuals who have that history, we set them up from the beginning. They get the ILK the day of surgery, three weeks later, six weeks later, nine weeks later. And then we're, we're prepped to avoid the situation, which is yeah, great. That, that's how you do it. And, and those patients as well who have a history of more ingrown hairs, you know, if they shave against the grain on their beard, they get an ingrown hair. They know it. Those patients, we start them right from the beginning. They're on an antibiotic. They're on soaks and scrubs. They're followed carefully postoperatively. You try to make sure you leave the grafts a little elevated so that it's less likely to happen. You just stay ahead of where the problems might happen. Yeah, so... Actually, for example, my father recently had a hair transplant and he was someone that was prone to, even prior to the hair transplant, he always had an itchy scalp. He always complained, I have bumps on my scalp, what's going oh, no. on? And he had a hair transplant and he's been dealing with um, a good amount of folliculitis. Do you think that there are people that are more prone to developing complications like folliculitis? I understand you just mentioned if people get ingrowns from shaving. Um, and do we believe that this may be partially due to embedded hair follicles? So, I mean, the folliculitis can happen, I think, even if the surgery is done properly. Um, you know, there are just individuals prone to it, especially individuals with curly hair. It tends to just grow in. Um, right. So really, the, the key is to say, I know this is what's coming and this is how we're going to treat it. So. If your father came to me, I would start him probably on, it's it's a very old fashioned treatment for folliculitis. You use a liter of saline, you add five mLs of bleach and five mLs of vinegar and you do soaks. So you soak the top and then you do a really good washing and you just do that on, you know, once or twice a day until it resolves. It resolves beautifully. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really good treatment. If there are spicules that have remained in. So sometimes, you know, the hair follicle that's been inserted in surgery has a short hair in it. That short hair, if it doesn't shed, 
it acts almost as though it's a um, like a splinter in the head. And then you get this sterile folliculitis that forms around it. So those spicules pulling them out, I mean, the follicle remains embedded. You're just taking out the splinter and that can help resolve the folliculitis as well. Okay. That's really helpful. It almost sounds like uh, the old fashioned benzoyl peroxide combination. Yeah, it can be, but that's a little more drying to the scalp, a little more drying. Yeah. So if patients ever come in and they're like, you know, Dr. Unger, I'm having crusting, I'm having itching, drying, and I'm sure you don't have that many patients who say that because your work is excellent. What do you typically tell them, whether it's in the donor or recipient site? How do you manage that? Yeah, so it's really about just keeping the area moist. Um, it's also about using a good shampoo that's a pH balanced shampoo. Sometimes people are using these shampoos that just strip their scalp of everything. Mm -hmm. So I have a few shampoos I recommend. I'm not a promoter, um, mm -hmm. but there's uh, like Leonore Grail has an amazing product um, that is helps create a more natural microbiome on the scalp. They have one called the gentle propolis shampoo. Um, and it's good for patients that have seborrhea as well. Um, I will tell them they can use a water-based lubricant. Um, and then occasionally I give them also that garamycin um, clobetazole combination. And uh, it's a cream, so it's emollient and it does help with um, resolving some of that as well. It's really about that care um, of, of making sure, because really what happens is people are afraid to touch their scalp after surgery. They're not properly cleaning it. And just as if you didn't properly clean your face, you'd get all sorts of stuff. Build breaking. up and debris. Yeah. Yeah. So what's your thought on prophylactic antibiotics? I've traditionally used them um, because there's very little downside. Um, so I do use a prophylactic antibiotic. Um, also, we're a surgery center that's uh, JCO certified, so it's part of the protocol. Um, if somebody has a history of folliculitis, I do start minocycline um, two weeks prior to surgery and I keep them low dose, hundred milligrams daily. I keep them on it for about six weeks after. Okay. That's very helpful. And then we covered folliculitis, but you know, a lot of patients have scalp psoriasis, seborrhea. What do you do in, in, in those cases? Because I mean, yeah, you're injecting ILK, so you're probably going to help calm that down for a little bit, but it might flare again during their recovery period. Um, do you just tell them oh. to, again, apply that topical medication? Well, uh, usually what I like my patients to do is get that under good control before they come in. So I'm fortunate being at Sinai and having people like Dr. Mark Lebwall, you know, that I can mm -hmm. refer a patient to, they get them uh, under really good control before we do the surgery. That really is the ideal scenario. Um, Seborrhea, Seborrhea is, is, is so ubiquitous now right. um, that it's really the, the special shampoos that I recommend they use helps keep it at bay. And if necessary, then we add the topicals. Yeah. Only a hair transplant, obviously the ideal scenario is to not have a lot of pain and most patients do pretty well. Um, and we didn't mention the use of Botox. Are there any other strategies that you take to mitigate pain after surgery? Yeah. So um, one of the things is, is using the steroid on the day of surgery in order to reduce the post-operative swelling. So obviously day two or three post-op is where you get a lot of the swelling and that can pull on the sutures. So we want to do everything we can to keep that down. We do the ILK in, in the suture line. We do the Botox. Um, we have them ice um, at the base of the neck, not mm -hmm. on the suture line, because we don't want to constrict the blood flow there too much, but at the base of the neck in order to help prevent swelling from occurring there. Um, we give them a special neck pillow to take the pressure off of the area. 
um, when they're sleeping at night. How Usually long do the, you suggest they use that for? The first two, three nights. It's really to get them through that post-operative swelling period. Okay. Yeah. And then do you usually recommend that they wash their hair uh, the next day? So I have a very involved post-op course. Um, I started off as a technician, so I got to see what happened during the post-op course, more so than many of the physicians used to see. So um, what I realized is getting extra washes in the office, make sure that everything gets as clean as possible, as quickly as possible, and then it heals faster and better. So um, our patients come in the first day post-op, they get a wash. Um, they often will come in the second day for another wash. Um, the following week, if they wanna come for what we call the midweek wash, they come for that. And that's in between they've been washing on their own and we get to see are they being afraid? Are they not mm -hmm. doing it properly? Do we need to offer them a few more washes? Um, so that by day seven, eight, um, there should be essentially no crusting on the donor area. The top might have a little bit left until about day 10, but that's basically what you want. You want to see that it's clean. And, and you're and really it, educating them how to do it, which is yeah. so important. Because I know that there's a fear to even touch your scalp, as we mentioned, right after people are scared they're going to dislodge the hair follicles. Exactly. Um, so in terms of scalp ischemia, what are the risks for developing it during a transplant? Do you ever have to use nitroglycerin paste to dilate the blood vessels in case of ischemia? So I have never had to. Um, I, I'm not... I'm, I tend to lean towards a more conservative rather than radical approach. Um, and that means I don't take out too wide a strip and close with tension. I don't create sites so close together that I can get ischemia. Um, so I've never run into it. I will knock on wood just in case. Um, I'll knock on wood too. <laughs> Um, I know there's a variety. Yeah, you can use nitro paste on it. Um, if that happens, if you see something turning dusky, um, I have had sometimes patients who seem to, you know, just the color doesn't look exactly the way I usually expect it to. In those patients, I'll just apply some topical minoxidil on the day of the surgery and mm. every day thereafter, it's, it gives you a little bit vasodilation and can risk that. Um, but ischemia is not really, shouldn't be a problem if it's done properly. Right. Okay. And then say you have a patient who, you know, months later after like they're now in month 10, 10 to 12, and they're kind of like having unsatisfactory hair growth, not necessarily from their point of view where it's like, oh, Dr. Unger, I want a second transplant. It's more like you are not totally satisfied with their hair growth um, or you notice some patchiness post-transplant. Um, what potential causes are investigated at that point and what actions would you consider taking? So um, poor hair growth should be a rarity, um, if ever. Um, but it can happen if we have someone who's a heavy smoker. Mm -hmm. It can happen if the scalp has a lot of solar damage and is very atrophic when you do the surgery. Um, sometimes there may be reduced growth. Um, if the grafts were placed too close together and the blood supply was somewhat insufficient, you could sometimes get poor growth. Um, uh, those are, I think, the main culprits I think we would look at, but we also in this day and age have to look with a dermatoscope and make sure we're not seeing signs of anything like LPP or FFA because I have had exactly one case, I won't forget him, but I check every patient before I do the surgery with dermoscopy, no signs of LPP or FFA, 
did the surgery, he called me, we saw him, his usual post-op, and about six weeks after, he called and said, I don't know, it's really itchy, it's red, and I said, well, come in, let me see it, and I looked, and oh, uh, okay, and on dermoscopy, he had, you know, perifollicular casts and erythema, and he had, obviously, it was in a dormant phase when I evaluated him, and he it, the surgery, you know, with the trauma capnerization, it activated it, got him straight on treatment, and he actually held on to everything. But had I not, it would have. Or had he off. not called you? Yeah, he was lucky. He came in. Oh, so I have him. had. So I have had patients who had surgery elsewhere. They called the doctor about redness, itching. They assumed it was the regular redness, itching of post-operative healing. They didn't see the patient and it was uh, FFA and it killed off the grafts, mm -hmm. you know? So yet yeah, you, ha you have to just see the patient. You have to put your eyes on the patient. Um, if you can't, and sometimes I have people from other countries, then luckily I have a big referral source I can send them to and have them looked at. Right. Yeah. So if, if the growth is less than expected and you can figure out the reason why, then you can always go in and touch something up. If the growth is less than expected and you don't know why, I don't know that I would recommend going in and doing another one until you figure it out. Figure it out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's always a reason. And that's why also it's so important to get like a really thorough history like you know some patients don't even realize that they many patients don't know that they have lpp or ffa um they just think their their scalp is itchy um actually i recently saw um, a patient with dr schombach and this patient said that she was she said that she was pulling out her hair and that she was seeing a therapist she said she had trickle telomania and we took a look actually with dermatoscope and we said no, you have LPP. And so like all along for like years, she said she was itchy. So she would pull out her hair, but the real, maybe there was like an overlap of trickle telomania, but the real underlying condition was that she had LPP. So it's yeah. so important because before you want to, before you operate on anyone, and this goes for hair transplants or anything you do, um, you want to make sure that their situation is under control. Um, how do you, um, manage donor shock loss, which we mentioned a little bit in the beginning, um, which is like a telogen effluvium. So, I mean, I tell patients it can happen, uh, expect it to happen, then you'll feel pleasantly surprised if it doesn't. It doesn't, I, we, you know, the literature will say about 50% of patients will have it. And I think it's much less than that in reality in my practice. But I just tell people, if you know it can happen and you count on it happening, you'll feel lucky if it doesn't. And if it does, you'll just, you know, manage your expectations appropriately. It starts coming back about three to four months after surgery, um, regardless. But if you want to have it come back sooner, you can apply minoxidil and that will help it come back sooner. Um, but it starts coming back three or four months uh, after surgery on its own and just resolves. Do you think if patients have had a prior um, episode of telogen effluvium that they're like predisposed to getting um, this shock loss? Yes, I do. I think so. Do you? pre-medicate them with, I mean, of course, in my opinion, and you're the expert, basically everyone who comes for a hair transplant should be appropriately managed first with medication, whether it be dutasteride, minoxidil, finasteride, we can go on and on with the list. Um, do you think that those medications actually can decrease your risk of having this um, TE in the in post-op? Um. Minoxidil, maybe. Because uh, they I, increase blood flow. Right. I don't think the others reduce the risk of the post-op um, shock loss. They just help keep everything else that's there stable. Mm -hmm. uh, but minoxidil potentially could. Right. Yeah. And I don't want to take up too much of your time because you've been so generous uh -huh. with it. But what are your thoughts on 
red light therapy. Um, I know there's a lot of like, you know, mixed opinions, the data, some data is strong, some data is unclear. Um, do you find that there's any benefit in using a red light therapy um, helmet or cap for recovery phase? Um, I think in patients who have a tendency to get inflammation, the red light may be helpful. I think the literature is still very limited. So, but at least theoretically, I can imagine it could be helpful. Um, I don't generally use it, but I don't dissuade my patients from using it either. I say it certainly won't hurt and it could help. Right. Okay. Well, Dr. Unger, did we miss anything that's you know, vital in the complications that people experience um, post-transplant? I don't think so. The only thing I would say is, you know, it's not technically a complication, um, but one of the most important things is being realistic about what you're going to be able to achieve for a patient. And I think, you know, if you call it a complication, one of the most, uh, you know, upsetting things will be is if a patient feels like, oh, they thought they were getting something that they didn't get. Um, so I think it's super important to be clear what we can achieve with surgery, have the expectations be realistic, and if anything, under promise and over deliver. Uh, I think that would probably be a really important point if I was coaching somebody on, on, on starting in this field or how to be successful in this field. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Unger. You know, I aspire to be like you one day and it's really amazing that you started with your father as right as a technician and, I think if you can do what the technicians do, because I honestly think that their part is their job is like the hardest, then you can do an excellent job um, as a physician. So, so I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. It was really great meeting you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Derm Club podcast. If you found the discussion today to be valuable, please subscribe and share. I look forward to seeing you in the next episode as we continue to delve into dermatology and skincare with the world experts.